Hey Christian, thank hey, you for coming on the 8th Lane podcast. Um, I'm excited to get into all of your trail stuff from last year, 2023. <laughs> uh, just to start us off though, for anyone who doesn't know who you are, do you want to just give us a brief little bio about who you are, where you run, etc.? Sure, yeah. Uh, my name's Christian Allen. I have a nickname, Slim. I guess I go by a bit, but uh, Where did I run... that come from? Um... <sighs> Maybe on the mission a little bit. I served okay. a religious mission and um, I was skinnier, you know, like as a distance runner. So people just called me slim and it just kind of stuck. stuck. That's awesome. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I happened to stick at Weber State and it's kind of stuck since. So, yeah, I've enjoyed it. Um, but right now I run at BYU. I'm just finished up my last uh, semester there. So I'm finished on my outdoor season of track. Um, and I love to trail run. That's kind of what I'm hoping to do. I'm talking to a few brands and hoping to wrap up um, a contract here when I finish at BYU and focus on trails, but I also like to do some uh, road marathon racing as well. Yeah, you're like jack of all trades. I feel like we could take <laughs> like four podcasts and focus on like each of the running <laughs> disciplines that you like are really good at. I appreciate um, it. Last year, though, so you started out last year in the outdoor track season, right? Yeah, I had a full season last year. So last year I did like cross, indoor, outdoor. Oh, dang. Okay, so what was the training like at the beginning of your year? Were you were you planning to run trail or were you even <coughs> thinking about that then? Yeah, um, I was planning on running trail. It was a little kind of, I had to kind of ease into it a little bit because I had actually just finished coming off my track season and I had a stress fracture in my fibula head from steeplechase. I tried steeplechase and just, uh, <laughs> I had probably some pretty crappy form on the water barriers and ended up fracturing my fibula. So once I started running the trails, it was about like five weeks, I think after I found that out. So I was a little worried to like do a lot of the pounding on the, the decline or descending kind of stuff. But um, Spico was like, I think seven weeks out or something. I was like, okay, I gotta get some time on my feet and get no things way. rolling. So. so you found out you had a stress fracture and then you were already <laughs> signed up for speed goat seven weeks after that? Yeah, I kind of signed up for a few races already. Um, so I think I found out about the stress fracture at the very end of April. So like the first, first week of May or last week of April and then finished the track season at the end of May. And then I had about, I think speed goats like the middle of July or something. Yeah. So maybe six, seven weeks, so. Luckily, I had a little longer time from when I had that, so maybe like 10 weeks from when I injured it or so, but. So it sounds like you almost had, I mean, you had seven weeks <clears throat> from the end of track season to speed go. Yeah. But you had a stress fracture, so was there really any time to kind of switch your training mode to a 50K distance? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually got in some pretty good weeks. I was like, I think very blessed. I think God just helped me kind of get through it and, mm -hmm. um, I like taped my leg up a bunch and like, luckily like the fibula is not like super weight bearing. It's like 15%, 10 okay. to 15%. Um, so I just like would tape my leg and really like compress it. So like my my tibia was taking the weight bearing, which it's supposed to. So, mm -hmm. um, and I did a lot of incline running on treadmill, like when I was initially hurt or like kind of cross training ultra G stuff and that like low impact really allowed, I think to heal pretty quick. And um, I did a few other modalities and, yeah, I was really surprised I had no issues at all, so. That's awesome. Yeah, it was great. And maybe that like incline treadmill running, maybe even like leaned into speed goat training because speed yeah. goat is so hilly. For anyone who <laughs> is listening, who doesn't know what speed goat is, do you want to give a little overview of yeah. what it is? Yeah, um, I mean, I don't know if it's necessarily the hardest 50K in the US, but it's kind of like been uh, keyed that a little bit by Carl Meltzer, it's his race, he started it. Um, and Carl Meltzer, his nickname is the Speed Goat, was like a super like killer ultra marathoner guy on the trails. And so he wanted to kind of make one of the most like rugged, like gritty 50Ks out there. And so he did it up Little Cottonwood and it starts over in kind of the Snowbird Alta area. And you just like ascend a lot of these peaks around there. And uh, it's pretty gnarly. I think it's like using, you know, like 32 miles with like 11 to 12,000 feet of vert, so. Yeah, but it's, it's a fun one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the first time I'd heard about it, I had a friend who was like, I just DNF'd a 50K. And I was like, you, you DNF'd a 50K? And he was like, yeah, it's actually really hard. <laughs> and yeah, it's a crazy cool race. Going into it, this was your first ultra marathon, right? Yeah. So were you 
thinking you were going to take first. <laughs> this is a pretty competitive race, like in the ultra scene. Yeah. I mean, I was just finishing up that last kind of uh, collegiate season. I was kind of debating on whether to come back for this last season here at BYU because I didn't have cross country, but I did have an indoor and outdoor track. And I was also kind of fiddling with like, okay, like I need to have a really good uh, rookie kind of trail season to kind of get my name out there and hopefully get some contracts, um, offers or just kind of contacts there. And so I set up a fairly beefy, I feel like trail season, but I knew like Speak Out would be like one of the big ones I was kind of looking for. So mm -hmm. I had like a little tune up race at Cirque Series, which are obviously super fun and mm -hmm. just a little quicker uh, injecting of the fuel, so to speak. But Speedgo, I knew it would be like pretty good. Um, and up until that point, I think like my longest run was like 22 miles. So I Dang. definitely knew I needed to like get a little more time on my feet and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> so at that point you hadn't even ran a marathon. No, yet. no. <laughs> That's so crazy. Yeah, I actually ran a marathon two weeks out from Speedgo and mm -hmm. that was like my longest run. <laughs> so <laughs> crazy. I was kind of like balancing, like coming back from this injury and not overdoing it too quick. So I did get some good mileage weeks in. I don't remember exactly, but I think I hit a couple over 100 mile weeks with some like 20, uh, over 20,000 feet of verse. So I did have like some good time on my feet and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I did like a, a marathon two weeks out down in St. George, but it didn't have like a ton of verse, it was only like three or two or 3,000 feet, but it was like good to kind of get a little longer distance. Yeah. And I feel like my training was really good, but the one thing, I realized I didn't do as much of was like going up and then down and then back up. Cause like mm -hmm. with Spigo, like you peak and then you go down into like AF Canyon, then you have to peak again, and then you kind of go back down into Little Cotton and then you have to peak again, and then you go down. <clears throat> and uh, I did a, like a lot of vert, but it was more like just going up, peaking mm -hmm. something and then coming down. It wasn't like up, down, up, down training. And it like, I was uh, <laughs> I was in the pain cave the last little bit at Spigo, I was like, Please, no more up downs. Like, like stop. just let me peek and go down. So, <laughs> yeah. So, what was that like mentally switching from like track, which is pretty short, to like a 50K? How long did Speed Go take you? Uh, I think it was like five hours and 24, 20 so something. Fast for Speed Go. That's awesome. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. So, what was like the mental shift like? Do you feel like you could pull on the same strategies that you? use in track or do you feel like it was a completely different type of feel yeah i feel like running in general is a very mental sport mm. <clears throat> there's a lot of uh kind of combating those negative thoughts and uh you know putting yourself in a good mental state so <clears throat> excuse me definitely in speako i i had times where i was like oh man i i can't do this or like i just like like i just want to give up but uh <laughs> definitely like I was like okay like just go like a little bit farther um just a little bit longer and I've had like a lot of mantras over the years that have helped me get through races I feel like putting me in a good mindset um and they kind of vary depending on the race or the terrain but like when I've used in cross country and track a lot is like look good feel good run good mm. and not like necessarily like look good like you just did your hair well but like look good running like good form and then feel good and then run good and just kind of like stuff like that, or like, I can hang with anyone, um, I can beat anyone, I can outkick anyone, just like stuff like that. And obviously I'm, I know there's other people that are out there that have way faster times than me in various events, but um, until you're willing to believe those things, it's not, like that's the first part is believing those things before they can come true. So mm. it's definitely helped me. Like I knew talking to a lot of people like, okay, like you, we know you're like a great trail runner, and like just be careful though like they'd all, I always kind of like get these like stipulation comments it feels like mm -hmm. you're like oh like I know you kill the trails but just remember like be careful out there at Speedgo like be smart don't go out too hard and <laughs> I was like okay yeah whatever whatever like that's like the typical thing you hear and I definitely like probably should have went out maybe a little more conservative but mm -hmm. like um because I definitely was struggling at the end but yeah I don't know I just feel like I but you won. Yeah, so. it went well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just grew in, went into the race feeling like I could beat um, or hang with anyone that would be there, regardless of mm. just kind of like my background. I knew if I put in the training and the work um, and trusted the process that I could have a shot at winning it. So That's really cool. So almost just like the self-belief that you learned to like instill in yourself in the track season just translated really well to the ultra 
world. Yeah, kind of what I'm I hearing. feel like running, yeah, re- regardless of your event, you kind of have to have that mental side and you can exercise that and grow that regardless of the distance, so. Mm-hmm. So in what way was the pain cave different for you? <laughs> like track hurts, track is hard. Yeah. But in what way, like how was the hurt different for the 50K? Yeah. Um, I remember going into it, my wife was like, oh, hey, just like try to enjoy it, you know, a bit. Cause mm-hmm. like you're out there for so long. And I was like, yeah, you know what? Like I am gonna enjoy it. And <laughs> I enjoyed like the first 18 miles. <laughs> and then like right at the bottom of AF Canyon before I came up, I like took a fall. Uh-huh. And it was nothing like too bad. I just tripped and fell and like kind of scuffed on my knees and hands a little bit. But then when I got up, my legs felt like lead and I was like, mm-hmm. oh man. And then that's when you start ascending for like the second time. And I was like, oh boy, like, and <laughs> like, it just oh. got, like, got worse and worse. Like I've never power hiked in my life. <laughs> and I had to power hike that race and I was like sweating bullets cause I was like, oh bro, like I've led this from like, Every time I got farther in the race, I was like, I've led it from the gun and I'm gonna Mm. blow it now. Like someone's just gonna run past me and I know I do not have the energy to go with them. I'm just gonna like crumble. And (laughs) I remember going to the last aid station at um, Hidden Peak, Uh I think is like, that's where the gondola goes up to there. And uh, I'm like dead. Like I remember the two previous aid stations, like I literally would grab a Coke every aid station and (laughs) just drink as much as I I could (laughs) and just throw it to the side. like. I don't know, Coke was like my saving grace. And uh, just to get like a different taste of fuel mm. or something like that. Yeah. And I went into the last one and um, apparently at one point in the race, I had like a 13 minute lead. And then I kept hearing from different people, like it was like, oh, like he's like six minutes or like, <laughs> and apparently like the tracking, live tracking was mm. like really wrong apparently. <laughs> Cause always, like, yeah, like really it wasn't wrong. super accurate. So then someone would be like, oh, like you got this big of lead. And I come up to like the next point, like, oh, you only got like, four or five minutes like oh no like <laughs> I'm done for is like what I was thinking I was like okay like I just got to get to the top and then I got to that and I was like okay it's all downhill from here is what I thought but there's mm. a few parts where you got to climb <laughs> and they like almost kill me like they're probably like the weakest climbs ever but by the end I was just like so done with climbing mm. and I remember coming to the A station I was like yo like um I looked like a zombie I feel like I was just like unresponsive and I just like ran through the A station I was like how much longer do I have? And the guy's like, he like, I think he could tell I was hurting because he's like, oh, it's like four miles. And I was like, okay, thanks. And I like grabbed my bottle and I took off and I start running and I'm like, no, wait, bro. Like that guy was full of it. Like it took nine miles to get up here. There's no way they, there's no way, there's no way they cut off five miles back down to the finish. And I was like, oh, I got like at least (laughs) seven more miles. And so I was like, okay, like if I can go six minute pace, I doubt the person behind me is gonna go five minute pace like in, mm. in the latter stage of this race. I was like, okay, if I can just lock into sixes, I'll probably win this. Cause like at that point I got up to there and I think someone was like, oh, he's got like, you got like four or five minutes. Mm. And I actually had more distance than that, mm. but like the live tracking was just wrong. And so I was like really worried. And then I passed someone with like two or three miles, I think two miles. I was like, how much time do I have? He's like, you got two minutes. I was like, oh, oh no. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I was like, they're just pulling numbers. I know, like, I'm like, <laughs> dude, this cannot be any worse. I'm gonna blow it in like the last two miles. And I was like, he's like, just give me 12 minutes. I was like, okay, if I can do six minutes, like mm-hmm. it's very unlikely. And I ended up getting to the finish. And I remember I turned the last corner and looked back up the mountain. I don't see anyone. I was like, dude, I'm like, like walking this in. I guys. like jogged like <laughs> so slow to the finish. And I got to the finish and I was like done. I just like practically collapsed. They had to like carry me off in a stretcher oh or like a, no, a wheelchair or something like that. Oh I think I was just so sick of having like straight liquid calories for like yeah. five and a half hours. I remember I was like, my stomach was just felt awful. And it was like pretty hot that day. By the mm. time you finish, it gets like 80 or 90 degrees. The and heat makes the stomach issues yeah. just like so much worse. Yeah. That was one thing I think I could have done better. I was like just practicing more. I mean, I did practice like fueling, but like mm-hmm. five and a half hours of just like straight liquids is like, yeah. by the time I was done, I was like, I don't care what the solid food is. Just give me any <laughs> solid <anything>. food. <laughs> I ate so much stuff at the end. It was, it was crazy. Mm-hmm. So you would change probably your nutrition plan. Yeah, I think doing a little more nutrition and definitely doing a little more up, down, up, down. Um, Ironically, like a week later, I ended up running with like a friend, Zach Gardner, and we did like this uh, run where you start at Rock Canyon, you run up 
and you peek over the saddle of like Cascade Saddle and you go down okay. to Big Springs and then back up and it's like 26 miles and you get like 10,000 feet of vert almost or like 9,000, 10,000. I was like, dude, that's like the perfect run for run. like yeah. the speaker. I was like, why did I not do this? <laughs> like I like did it after and I was just like, oh man, this would have been like perfect. Yeah, because you like go up and then you go down and then you have to peak up again. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, like I definitely have some good ideas of like better runs to do mm. uh, in the future that would just, I think, specify for that. Yeah. I mean, you killed at speed go. It sounds like it was definitely like type two fun, probably <laughs> super miserable <laughs> while you're doing it. But after, I mean, you ran trail races again. So yes, after it was fun. <laughs> yeah. I think I finished. And I was like, I'm never running an ultra again. And then like a week later, I was already like thinking, oh man, I could have done so much better here, here and here. And I was like, I got to go back and like do better at the race. So I think a lot of people that run ultras say that same thing. Like they finish oh, totally. and they're like, I'm never running a hundred miles or whatever, yeah. <laughs> you know, and then yeah. they're back at it a couple months later. So exactly. Um, so after the 50 K, would you do you like the 50 K distance? You've done a couple other like trail distances. Yeah. Do you prefer 50 K? Is there another distance do you th that you, you prefer? I like, I think 50 K is kind of like my cap, but I do like it. I'd love to do mm. like a little bit of a faster 50 K. Mm. Um, but I do love like doing a lot of vert too. So I'm not opposed to that. I think I've kind of considered like a 50 miler, but I think I'll hold off for a little while. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think 50K to like VKs is kind of like my sweet spot. Like VKs are super fun. They're like two to three miles. Almost feels like a 5K on the track, like just full throttle and just like real quick and they get over like, you're like, oh, I'm dying. But then like before you know it, it's like over it's like, over. oh, well, I'm done kind of thing, so. And wasn't your first VK, so soon after Speed Goat, you went to Italy. Yeah, yeah. With, who did you go with to Italy? Um, so I made a Team USA. So I ran for Team USA at Challenge Stellina. Oh, um, cool. And then I s ended up extending my trip on a whim and running uh, two WMRA races. So the WMRA World Cup Series, I ran two races there. Um, and I did a VK and then like an up-down race a week cool. after. So yeah, it was super fun. So you, how many races was that in what period of time? Sounds oh. like. <laughs> yeah, I had a pretty like busy schedule because I did a Cirque series, I think like three weeks out from Spigo and I did Spigo and then. Which Cirque series? That's probably Alta or is Yeah, that I did, shoot, I think it was Snowbird. Okay. And then I did um, Spigo and then three weeks later, I think I did Alta. And then a week later, I did the USA Challenge Stellina. And then the week after that, I did the two races, the VK and the, I think it was a half marathon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, half marathon. And then. And all those are really vert heavy, right? Yeah, yeah. None of them were really flat mm, at all. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, some of them definitely don't have as much vert, but like, I think the lowest climbing you did is like, almost 3,000 feet, so it's like 2,800 mm. maybe. Like the Cirque Series are usually like anywhere from seven to nine miles and anywhere from like 2,700 to like 3,500 feet of vert. Mm. And then to the Challenge Stellina for Team USA, that was, they had to modify it because it was actually like an absolute like downpour in Italy. And apparently like the road they <laughs> are able to get us down on is like this tiny dirt road and they drive a huge bus up to the mountain. Oh gosh. And so they're like, yeah, it's like all washed out and we don't want to kill you all. So like, <laughs> we're going to do like, they had to like cut the race in half. So it ended up being like four miles and like 2000 something feet of vert instead of like eight miles and, and double. it was like almost double. They had to cut the oh, race okay. in half. So, okay. Yeah. So which of those Italy races was your favorite? You placed at all of them. I think I read online, yeah. which yeah. is awesome. It was super it's crazy fun. to like run to compete that close together and yes. place all of them is so cool. Yeah, I wasn't planning to do that many races, but I was like, oh man, I'm here, I might as well. Like, <laughs> I remember like the second race in Italy, like having done three races in like seven days, I was like gassed, I was like so done. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was super fun. Like I loved the place I was at in Italy for the WRMRA was uh, in Trofeo uh, or Nasigo in mm -hmm. Italy and it was gorgeous. Like the area was just so pretty. It was like in this little like tucked away village up in the mountains um, and it was just so fun. And the VK race I loved, like that was my first experience doing like a VK and I was like, 
oh man, these are like sick. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> it like sucked, but at the same time, I was like, oh, it's like over so quick, you know? And before you know it, you're just like, it's just a straight uphill race. So that one was super fun. And it was probably gorgeous. Oh yeah, so pretty. Like, Was it in the Dolomites then or where? <sighs> no, it was a... Uh, <laughs> It was wasn't quite as close to there, but okay. um, just up in the Swiss Alps kind of area. Oh, okay. So just super pretty. Like we got there a couple days before, and and me and a couple friends got to like explore the mountains, and it's so Ugh. fun. Like there's like these little refugios, so you can like run up to places and like just make an adventure out of it. Mm -hmm. Like you could stop and get some food or a coke at a place, and then run for another ten miles That's to another so place awesome. and. So it was a blast. Like the views yeah. there were absolutely gorgeous. Like they overlooked all these little cities and villages down in like the valleys. So it was super cool. So will you go back this year? Are you planning anything out in Italy or? Yeah, um, I'd love to go back to that race because the people and the hospitality and just the race was so awesome. Um, mm -hmm. And we made some great friends, but that race won't quite fit into my schedule this year. Okay. But I am planning a few others. I'm uh, wanting to bring my family out there, hopefully, we're trying to see if logistics makes sense for about three weeks to a month. And That'd be so cool. yeah, it would just be really cool. And so I'm looking at doing Sierras and all, and then- um, What is Sierras and all? So it's a big Golden Trail World Series race. Oh, cool. And uh, Golden Trail World Series and WMRI, they kind of like co-own it like Broken Arrow. Mm. Um, so that's like a big part of the Golden Trail World Series. And then two weeks later, I'm gonna do OCC since I qualified with that from Speedco. Mm. So I'll be there in Chamonix, which will be super, excuse me, super cool. That'll be way cool. Yeah. The year previously, we got to stay on the other side of Chamonix in Cormier, Um, And it was like gorgeous there, like just Ugh. breathtaking. So the mountains there, I'm super stoked to be back. And then I'm possibly going to add on like just this little race, um, a race before Sierra's and all like um, the tail end of August, or sorry, the tail end of July or 1st of August. So. Um, it's called, it's like a flood of trail is what it was called, flood of trail in Milano. Um, so it's kind of, it last year was a part of the WMRA series, but this year it's not because they have a lot of races in Italy. So they had to kind of spread out to a few other countries, but mm. I might do that race. And then, but the two big ones are Sears and all and, uh, and then OCC. That there. will be so exciting. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. excited to follow. <laughs> so part of you going out to Italy with your family will be training for yes. those races that's really cool yeah that's awesome um so last year 2023 when you got back from italy you did pike's peak was that after italy yes <laughs> cool how did pike's peak go uh it was good till it wasn't uh it was probably <laughs> like my one bad race like the bad apple okay. of this last year's trail race and it was like kind of like one of the bigger ones i was like really i was like okay like yeah. i gotta be all ready for that and like some really big names were there oh yeah last year like big names yeah um so it was i got a race against quite a few of them over in europe and so i was like mm -hmm. and there's a few editions of people i hadn't raced and so i was like oh man this would be great to like get all the best like north american runners and then all the best european runners and some african runners and kind of mix us all together and it would have been like so yeah i was like super stoked for it um and i just think it's just kind of one of those off days mm -hmm. leading up to the race. I'd been actually sleeping in an altitude tent. I started sleeping in an altitude tent after Spigo, which is ironic because I should have done it for Spigo a little mm -hmm. bit with the higher altitude. But then I was in Europe uh, for two weeks and then I got back and I had a week before Pike's Peak and then we ended up going out to Colorado. And I just, just think I had a hard time like adjusting from, in Italy I was at like 3000 feet, which was lower than yeah. I even typically live here. And then Pike's Peak, it goes up to 14.1. And I've actually never ascended a, a 14er before. So it was like my first time ascending a 14er in the middle of the race. And I don't think I've ever even gone above like 12,000. It was what I was looking at before mm -hmm. because in Utah, we don't really have anything yeah. above that. Um, and I was feeling like pretty good. And um, But the whole week leading up, I was just having like my HRV and my heart rate was like pretty high. And I think I was mm -hmm. having a hard time adjusting just to the altitude because the places we were staying at were like, seven to 9,000 feet. And I'd been like the whole previous weeks at like 3,000 feet. And so- Yeah, that's a huge, just like over the course of a month, <laughs> it's like- <laughs> Yeah, so it was bummer. Cause I feel like I was pretty primed for it with altitude stuff before my trip to Italy uh, and it's there, but 
I still really enjoyed the Italy trip and just kind of the way the cookie crumbled, just a bad race in general. And I think I was actually doing pretty well. I was sitting in like fourth to fifth um, until wow. about mile nine or 10. And then like, I just, I slowly like the wheels just fell off with the altitude. I got to a point where like, <laughs> I was like pretty delusional by the end. And I had to be oh taken gosh. to like the aid station. And it took me a while, like after I started getting some food and then I got down the mountain, like the slower, like the more we went down, like mm -hmm. I just felt so much better. So, uh, so you're like definitely altitude. Yeah, it was like, it was awful. Like I remember I went from like fourth or fifth to like 30th and I remember people just passing me and I just was like, I can't do Mentally, anything. Mentally, do you remember like what you were thinking or how you were feeling or was it like super foggy? Um, but yeah, kind of foggy and I was mm -hmm. like super wobbly. I remember a couple times I come like switchbacks and I come up and then like eight people like, oh, are you okay? Like about to grab <laughs> me. I was like, I'm fine. Like. <laughs> I just need to get off this freaking mountain. You know, like you look bad when other people are like, yeah. are you okay? And uh, they're like supporting you. Yeah, I was like, oh boy. It, yeah, it was definitely a, a rough one. I'm kind of bummer, bummed that the W or the Golden Trust Series, it isn't a part of it this year because it, mm. it was last year. So I'm not planning on going to it this year, but I'd love to get another crack at it in the future and just mm. kind of redeem myself and yeah. get a better showing there, so. So when the field is stacked like that and you have like some tough competitors, I feel like I've heard from people either it makes them really excited because they're like, okay, this field is going to produce some really cool results from all of us or maybe you get super nervous. Which camp do you feel like you sit in most often? Um, I try not to think about it too much, honestly. Like that's been one cool thing I feel like with this – trail season not knowing as many of the people so mm. per se like I had this kind of thing in high school where you just kind of go out there and you have fun and you kind of throw yourself out there like I never really knew who I was competing against like mm. not because I didn't respect them but like I just wasn't like over worrying about like oh like who am I racing this week like what are their PRs and that mm. happened a lot in trails so I just show up to races and I like go out with whoever's in front or I like take the lead and lead the race. And then like afterwards someone would be like, oh, like you were hanging with like Patrick and Philemon or like you were like up there with these people. And I was like, I don't know. Yeah, I guess like, <laughs> sure. I don't really know who they are. And then you start to realize like, oh wow, like they're killing it. Like they're winning all these big races. And so yeah, Pike's Peak, I just knew like, I've never raced Remy before, but I was like, oh man, like he's That's like kind so of one of the crazy. goats. Like I want to go out <laughs> with him. So. I went out and it was like Remy, Patrick and Philmon. And then I was like right behind them, just kind of hanging on. And then mm. they gapped me eventually by like four or five miles into the race. And I kind of fell back and was in no man's land and forth for a while. But mm. yeah, I just kind of was like, I don't know. I just want to put myself out there. And um, I feel like I definitely could have ran it like smarter, like been a little more conservative, especially with like the altitude and just like how competitive it was. But I, I don't want to say I never do, but I hate going into races being like, okay, like I'm just going to compete for like fifth or sixth or like, mm -hmm. I always want to give my shot at a, give myself a shot at winning the race. Mm -hmm. um, so I just kind of threw myself out there and it definitely went sideways, but it was a good learning experience. <laughs> so how quick mentally do you feel like you're able to bounce back from something like that? Because to like really believe that you're going to take first, take some mental energy and then to not reach your goal is probably difficult how do you feel yeah it definitely ebbs and flows I feel like depending on like kind of the state you're in it's definitely okay. as much as training is physical I think it's just as much mental like you can kind of get in those states where like you're just like oh like training's not going well and it could be like training more mentally like I'm just coming back from an injury right now and I've had like a few kind of not so great workouts like mm -hmm. kind of getting back into it getting ready for world cross and I'm like oh man like I'm like, I don't know if I'm actually like ready for this or in great shape, but then I'm like, oh no, like that's just like my mental side, like kind of the negative side taking over. And so I think it's definitely like, it varies on the the races and the situations, but I felt pretty confident that I was like, okay, like I know I'm in great shape. Like I know I can hang or beat like a lot of these people. And I'm, I, I was like, I know I'm better than this kind of thing. And I was glad I had a few other races to kind of like prove that later in the year. Um, Cause then I bounced back um, and ran at the WMRA finals in Gran Canaria in Spain mm. and was able to um, do well there. And then I had. Um, so what happened in Spain? What was that distance? 
So I did it a VK, but ironically, <laughs> the VK was modified there. Um, oh, really? <laughs> apparently, like they had record high like hot temperatures there in Grand Canary, and there was like a fire danger. Oh, and like, geez. yeah, so they didn't want like people going above like a certain altitude because I guess if like there was a fire, then you, you get stuck or something weird. I don't know. It was kind of it was actually really interesting because when we say tree line here, we say like the trees like end at this certain point, you know? Mm. But actually in Grand Canary, we did like a super cool run to like the tallest point of the islands at the end of our, um, like the day after the races. And there's like no trees, it's like a desert. But then when you get to a certain point, trees start to like, That's there's starch crazy. trees, it's super weird. So there's a tree line, but it's like It's flips. like reverse, <laughs> yeah. Like I have pictures, it was super funny. Like we ran, it's like just like kind of really dirt rock, like almost like what you'd imagine like Iraq or Iran or like Southern Utah is like how the whole island is. Like it's not like this tropical island necessarily, mm. but then when you get up to the top, like all of a sudden there's trees. And That's so I think- so strange. <laughs> yeah. That's so strange. I think there was like a fire warning because once we got up there, all the trees up top are pine. And so there's a oh. bunch of like dead pine needles on, on like the grounds up there. Mm. So if there was ever a spark, like the whole place would like unite. So okay. there was like a modified VK. And then I also did um, a long distance race, which was uh, like 24 miles or something. Oh, cool. Yeah. And how did that one go? Pretty smoothly? Yeah, that one went well. I think I took third in the VK and then for, and then I won the long distance one. It's awesome. But the VK was like, it was, it was cool. I was like glad I podiumed and um, I was able to get Patrick or sorry, I was able to get Philmon back from like a little mm. while ago, which was nice. Like, and he's a phenomenal athlete. So whenever you're able to like, beat him, it's always like feels great. But I hated the way they did it because because of the fire, they actually did it in a timed period. So they'd send athletes every minute and a half. Oh, that's so, so strange. it wasn't like a mass start, which I feel like is better for me, at least for me personally, because I can kind of gauge it where I was off. Mm -hmm. And the way they sent people out was based off of your rankings in the WMRA series. And I'd only done the two races in uh, Italy. Mm -hmm. And so Which I- Which you did pretty well in though, Yeah, right? I took second yeah. and third. So I actually had some pretty good points. And I was think I think I was sitting overall in the rankings like in ninth, only okay. having done two races, but they take your accumulative score of, uh, or they, they take your score from five different races. And oh. so since I hadn't raced as much, my ranking wasn't as high. And so I got sent out in the ninth wave and they'd send people every minute and a half. So I actually caught the guy that was a minute and a half ahead of me. And then I almost caught the other guy that was three minutes ahead of me. That probably felt good. Um, and I, so I thought I was running really fast, you know, but yeah. like they were, they were athletes that were like not quite as competitive as the ones that are going behind me. Okay. So like, I wish I'd been like in the later stages where like Patrick and Philmon and Joe and Remy and all these other guys that were ranked really high, like mm. just, just to be a better gauge, so. I felt like I was like, oh, like I, I probably killed this race, you know? And then like I found out, I was like, oh dang, like I took third based off the time, but mm -hmm. it was still like a super fun experience and I was like great. And then it was fun to like cap it off with like a win the next day, so. Yeah, it sounds like a great time down there. Yeah, it was awesome. Was that the cap of your trail season then? Or did you come back for more races? I had one last race um, that was kind of unplanned a little bit, but then I had Ultra Spire reach out. Well, actually, um, Ultra Spire slash Andy, uh, one of my friends, Andy Wacker, he was at that race um, in Grand Canary. And he's like, yo, like I'm doing this race in Arkansas. It's their inaugural race this year, like first time them doing it. And it had like pretty good prize money, like <laughs> for like, yeah. a trail race, like more than I won at Spico. And what was the prize money? It was 3000. That's great. Yeah, and it was only a 10K. And I was like, mm. heck, like I do that any day. I had to go to the well for Speedgo and I got two <laughs> grand. I'll, I'll go to this one for three grand <laughs> if I can win it. Um, and it was super cool. It was kind of like a little mini USA trail champs because there was like a lot of great trail, um, just US trail runners with Andy and Joe Gray and Morgan and, um, oh my gosh, I feel so bad. Dan Kurtz, yeah, there you mm -hmm. go. Um, so. We had like a really good like just US showing and mm -hmm. it was just like a super fun race. It was two weeks out from my debut in the marathon. I was like, oh, like a 10K, oh like it'll be gosh. like a great stimulus. I don't know, yeah. I just thought it was like a great <laughs> stimulus. And I was like, okay, like as long as I don't break my ankle, like this yeah. will be like a perfect like little last hard effort and it worked out great, so. That's awesome. 
Yeah, I feel like the prizes at ultra distance races are so random because huge races like Speed Goat, the prize is like 2000 for mm -hmm. first place. But then there are like these tiny little backyard races that the prize is like 10 grand. Oh, yeah. And it's like, it just feels so random to me that it's not like divided better but oh yeah it's funny like the races and you'll hear in the difference in prizes but yeah the bentonville dirk circus was super cool so i'd recommend it to anyone i think they're growing it um it's kind of over in the area where like walmart's headquarters are so there's like <laughs> it's cool. i don't know if you know that area but walmart's put like millions of dollars into the trails over there have they really yeah like they have this crazy trail system there. like it's mostly tailored towards like mountain bikers but okay. like the trails there are phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, and the race we did was like super cool, but there was all like on a like a, a double black diamond part a little bit. So it got like oh, super yeah. rocky towards the end. <laughs> and like the first four miles are like really nice, pretty runnable, not too technical. And then the mm -hmm. last like two miles, a mile and a half, like there was so many leaves on the ground because it was late November. Mm. And then there's all these rocks and it was like, oh man, like I don't want to break my ankle here. Like that'd be the worst <laughs> thing right before the marathon. But it worked out great and the race was super fun. Mm. It sounds really fun. Yeah, I think they're just gonna keep growing it in the future. So I'm excited to see where it goes from here forward. Yeah, it's cool. So after having finished your first like trail season, I guess, what's your favorite trail terrain? Like, are you of the camp of like really verdy stuff? Do you like technical stuff, more flowy stuff? What was your favorite from everything you did? Um, Kind of. I don't mind too technical, but I'm not like the biggest fan of it. I think mm. Dirk's, I mean, I think the Cirque series are like a good blend, like okay. technical enough, but not like overly technical, like pretty runnable, but and I guess the Cirque series kind of blend of all three. Like there's some runnable sections, mm. but then there's some very steep sections. And there is also some like pretty technical sections, mm. depending on the race. Like Alta is a bit more technical than Snowbird. But yeah, I kind of like, I love just like getting a good flow and ripping it. So mm. like, um, I ran like a smaller race down in Southern Utah. Um, oh wow, I can't think of it. But uh, oh, the Red Mountain 30K, mm. and that one was like super fun because the trails are just like fast. You can like rip them and like you can go like five minute pace throughout the whole like That's race. Crazy. And like they're just like super fun, but mm. they are still like a little technical depending on where you're at. But mm. I definitely love stuff like that. But I do like mixing it up with like super steep climbing i know mm -hmm. i like a good blend of all yeah. <laughs> i guess you like everything i'm just not like amazing at like crazy technical downhill like i can send it i feel like pretty good but i mm -hmm. do know some people that are like absurd and then i know some people i'm like are you floating down because i don't <laughs> see where your feet are landing <laughs> yeah i have a few friends that i always uh link up with at cirque series and they like i have to take out cirque series so hard i feel like because they're so mm -hmm. good at the downhill that I'm like sweating bolts. By the time I get to the top, I'm like, man, I better have a good enough lead because they're gonna catch me on this downhill part because there's some animals out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I personally hate the technical downhill stuff. It just like, those are my moments that I'm like, I'm never <laughs> running again. <laughs> uh, so after your trail season, you ran your debut marathon, right? Yeah. How did that go? Uh, Yeah, all things considered, <laughs> it was decent, yeah. Um. I was like pretty ambitious with my goals and wanted to do really well. And uh, I want to get like the OTQ, of course. And before the race, I thought um, at CIM, I could get the, uh, there's like a US standard if you had to have ran 211, 30 or faster if you wanted to be on the USA team, if you finished top three at um, the trials. Oh, okay. And so I was shooting for that time, but then ironically I found out afterwards that it is an OTQ course, but it's not a world athletics course qualified. And what that means is like apparently it has too much up down vert. Oh. Like the race you descend like I think 11,000 feet, but you also ascend like 700 feet. It's like a very rolly yeah. course. So it's got a lot of hills in it. For fast marathons, that's like, quite steep yeah it? like it's yeah. got a lot of vert yeah. for like your typical marathon yeah um so it i found out like even though i didn't hit my goal time because i ended up blowing up at the end it's kind of a long story but mm -hmm. um my bottles kind of got put on the wrong table or didn't get put out 
Um, oh my gosh. And so I didn't get any fuel until after the half marathon. That's when I found my first bottle um, on a different table than what I was told my bottles would be on. And so I was feeling really good. Like I led the race from, there was a guy that kind of went out really fast and then we caught him like after a mile. So I led from like mile two to mile 23. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was feeling really good from about mile two to 21. And then like my nutrition really blew up because mm-hmm. I got my first bottle after the half and I came through in 104.46. So I was on pace for like a 209, which was like, I was hoping for like a two, 209, 210, 211 was kind of like my goal. Mm-hmm. Um, and was on pace for 209 all the way through mile 20. Three twenty three was like my first mile where I was like slipped above two and nine, and then I was on two ten pace, oh. and then it went like two eleven, two twelve, and then like I got past that mile twenty three, and I was going so slow. I felt like I was going so slow. I was going like upper five minutes because mm. my whole race I was averaging like four fifty sevens or so, and then it went like five five thirty, five forty five mm-hmm. six, and I had some like six thirties, and I ended up finishing at like two fifteen oh one. So were you watching this drop and like crap? <laughs> or was it just like <laughs> kind of I was like getting die. pretty deluged. I feel like my calories were so like cause the big thing yeah. with like those ultras or marathons, it's all about like getting ahead of the bonk, you know, like getting those calories in. So I'm I didn't get anything till mile thirteen. And then I was in race mode. There was me and this one other guy that broke away. We were just the the first two up front and he was right on my heels and we came around a corner and I like missed the table on mile 16. Like I was just in race mode. And then like literally as I passed it in my peripheral vision, I'm like, oh shoot, like was that the table? Mm -hmm. And sure enough it was. So I got some at 13, missed 16. And then my next ball I got was at 20 and then 23. Uh, and it was just too late by then. See so what, you had like 300 calories. Yeah, like it was point, so little. Insane. Like I had planned like double that, if not more. Cause yeah. I had one at mile six, 10, 13, 16, and like 20 and 23 or something like that. And I got like three of them. And um, so yeah, like it just got, it got really bad towards the end, but. Physically you just like, can't no yeah like, like literally it was the crazy it was like the most painful slowest miles i probably ever ran in my life like mm-hmm. i literally was like trying to move but like the wheels were just falling off like i like felt like i was running in slow motion like almost like when you're <laughs> in a dream or something i don't know if you had one of those dreams where like it's like freezing and everyone's like running past you're like what is going on <laughs> you're like trying to plow through it with your arms but nothing's working so yeah it was definitely rough but I didn't know, I was like, okay, I got some cushion because like, OTQ was like 218. Mm-hmm. But definitely like as things got worse and worse, like after, from mile 23, I was like, oh man, like I might bonk really bad. I'm like, mm-hmm. it was getting closer. I was like, oh man, I'm on pace for like, from like two, 209 to 210 to 211 to two, it kept <laughs> like, going. I was like, oh man, if I get up to 218, this is gonna be bad, mm-hmm. so. But luckily I was able to finish in and did you take a 215 at that one? Was yeah, 215.01. Okay. That's still amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. It was hard. Like it was, I had a lot of people like, oh, like you should be like happy for a debut. Like that's a great debut marathon. Mm-hmm. But it's, I feel like I was a little hard on myself just because I had like these big goals and I was like so close. Like I was 23 miles in out of 26, like on mm-hmm. pace for like my 210, uh, which what I, was what I was hoping for. And then to like see it slip, like just so quick there, it kind of was a bummer. So I was like super From eager. something as like stupid as race yes. nutrition that like you had planned out very well, it sounds like, but just whatever happened and you yeah. couldn't grab them. It was, it was a good learning experience too, just cause I realized like races and the people like directing those races they have a lot going on. So like, there's a lot of things that can happen, whether it's like maybe an athlete knocks down your bottle or maybe your bottles aren't on the right table mm-hmm. or um, you know, there's so many different factors. So it definitely taught me to like plan for backup stuff, like whether I have gels or mm-hmm. something just in case your bottles don't work out because um, it can happen to any race or any area that you're at. So it was definitely a good learning experience just to have, to know like, okay, like I gotta have backup plans in case my bottles aren't there or if they get knocked over or, you know, whatever might happen or if someone grabs your bottle, you know, someone could actually grab yours, stuff like that. Mm. So. so you, have the Olympic qualifying time. <clears throat> you were going to run in the trials earlier this year, but you couldn't due to an injury. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I finished. Um, CIM was on December third, and then the Olympic trials were on February third. So I had two months, um, which is a, 
kind of quick turnaround for marathons. So fast. <laughs> yeah, so I was a little nervous for that. Um, and honestly, like when I started getting back into training, I took off a week after the marathon um, and I ran like once that week, I think just to have a little down reset. And then I was like doing workouts um, like eight, nine days later, I, I bounced back. I did like 11 by K and then like on the next Thursday we did I can't remember what we did. We did another workout on Thursday and I was mm -hmm. like, oh, like, I feel like kind of heavy and sluggish, but like my times in the workouts were like pretty good. I was like, oh, like, I guess recovery is going all right. But then mm -hmm. like the next week I felt awful. I think I was like over overreaching, over training. Like I just, my body hadn't recovered just cause from those marathons or ultras and stuff like that, you get a lot of like micro tears and traumas to your muscles and, mm -hmm and bones and stuff like that. And I just, I don't think I've recovered. So I felt really crappy. I had to cut workouts that next week. And I really took about four weeks to finally start feeling like good. Like mm -hmm. I was able to do the workouts, but they just felt like the hardest things ever. I was like, oh man, like these paces and these workouts I was doing before, like mm -hmm. they felt so much easier. So after I hit about that, like 30 days or like four weeks, finally, like things started to turn around. I started feeling pretty good. And, um, I kind of set up another thing like I wanted to do a 10k two weeks out from the OTQ or from the Olympic trials and I ran a cross country USA cross country champs. Oh yeah, congrats. You made the oh, team, right? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I ran that um it was kind of actually a little crazy. I, I had a 3k race the week before cuz I was I was I have indoor track season at BYU mm -hmm. and outdoor track season and um, my coach Ed Eyestone was like super willing to kind of like work around. He's like, okay, like we got this OTQ and let's use your indoor season too. So we'll run a 3K at home and then you'll do the trials. And then like three weeks later, we'll throw you into conference and you can run like three or 5K at conference. And that all ended up kind of changing when I got injured, but mm. I ran a 3K at home. And that week my quads were actually starting to hurt kind of going into the race, but I kind of just thought like, a lot of times in the races, you kind of get like these like fake phantom pains, you know, like I feel like your body's yeah. just like, oh, like I'm racing, like my Please quads hurt <laughs> or like my calves hurt or, you know, like whatever it might be. And in reality, like they aren't really hurt. It's just yeah. like you kind of like psyching yourself up. So that's what I thought it was, but my 3K race didn't go super great. And so I was like, oh man, like I got mm -hmm. this cross country race next week and I was hoping to do really good. And so I was trying not to overthink it, but I kind of bounced back, I feel like, and had a good mental state going into it. But that whole week, like my quads were just like killing me. Like it was super weird. I was trying like everything, like massage, like magnesium lotion, like mm -hmm. cramping lotion, all this stuff. I just <laughs> thought like my muscles were, like cramping or shutting down. And, uh, but yeah, I like had a pretty cool experience. I feel like I was just like praying, asking God to help me. And like, it was like going into the race, like, the pain was bothering me but then like as soon as the gun went off like my pain went away and it was like a mm -hmm. super cool experience and i felt like great in the race and i wasn't like asking god to like make me win the race by any means but i was like oh like if you could help get rid of this pain just so i can feel like normal and like confident in my abilities i was like I, i'd appreciate it and like it would just be like a super cool miracle and sure enough like as the gun went off like i felt good and like mm -hmm. was able to perform and it was a super cool experience. First time running uh, U.S. Cross, and I was able to like get the sixth place. So they send the top six to Worlds, and I was able to just awesome. finally kick down like the last few people in the last little bit. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> that was super cool. Um, but then the next week, I came back and I was getting ready for the marathon, which was two weeks after that. And I ran um, the first half of the week, but my quads were just like really bothering me. Like I got through the workout fine. Um, that next Tuesday after the weekend's race. But like on the cool down, I was like, oh man, like it just felt like really weird. Yeah. Um, and then I ended up cross training the second half of the week and then eventually got MRIs. And that's when I found out about the stress uh, reactions and the femurs. And I was like, okay, like that makes more sense. And so it was kind of a hard <clears throat> decision. It was like either shut it down and get ready for world cross and hopefully be ready for that, like healthy. Mm -hmm. Or like, do I send it for the Olympics and then this could possibly get worse and like kind of ruin the rest of my outdoor season, you know? Yeah. Um, which was kind of the whole reason I came back to BYU. So kind of hard decision, but ultimately I decided to kind of like sit it out. And mm -hmm. uh, it was definitely hard because like the Olympics are every four years, you know? I was like, yeah. oh, like in 
college, like if you have to sit out a season, you just have to wait a year, which is still a long time. But so I was a little bummed about that, but it was fun watching. I I got to train with Connor and uh, Clayton and uh, we had a a guest in Sam Chalinga. He was out there with us. Mm -hmm. And then Jared Ward had to pull out because he was having some hamstring issues. So, but it was great watching like a lot of my training partners do so well. And um, it was just fun to be there and support them and stuff like that. Yeah, you guys seem like a tight group of people and you're all just amazing at what you do. (laughs) So like the competition probably pushes you to all just be really good at your craft, you know? Yeah, I'm really fortunate and lucky, I think, to be able to train with those guys. Um, They're studs and super talented and driven and hardworking. And so it's great to work out with those guys and have them push me every day and I feel like I definitely wouldn't have been in as good of shape or like primed as as well as I was for the different races I did on the roads and cross country if I wasn't able to train with those guys. So it was super fun. Yeah, it's very cool. I kind of want to jump back to, you've mentioned your faith a couple of times. Mm-hmm. We had uh, Tim Roberry come on, who's Safan Hassan and Alima Nakai, I think is her name. He's yeah. just a Nike coach. And he was... <laughs> mentioning that he all the like pro runners that he knows have some type of faith that he feels like really fuels their running and their training and their performance in what way do you feel like your faith is able to fuel your performance because that's a huge part of being at BYU is your faith oh yeah for sure yeah um I feel like having my faith has given me kind of a deeper purpose or meaning behind running. Um, I don't know if I am always the best at living it, so to speak. And what I mean by that is like, a lot of times I tell myself like, you know, like running's not everything. Um, Mm -hmm. And it really isn't like I have a beautiful wife and amazing kids and a great job and just an amazing life outside of running. And when running's not going well or I'm injured or stuff like that, like, I try to realize like, oh, like it doesn't need to like affect my whole life. You know, there's a lot of other things out there and like my religion and my family and other purpose. Um, and I do better better at it at different times, you know, like yeah. depending on how the <laughs> yeah, injury is really sure. setting me in. Sometimes I'm like really just kind of feeling down for myself. But I think having the kind of a grander purpose or view of like life and like why I'm here and um just god giving me these talents and allowing me to develop those talents that he's given me has really helped me to have kind of just a better overarching uh view and take on life in general so mm. yeah and you've mentioned a few times how like your wife before speed go she was like make it fun yeah and a few other races you said that you were just trying to keep it fun um your faith probably plays a little bit of a role into that but in what way do you feel like you're able to keep running fun even if you're like in the pain cave or like digging as deep as you can? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, I feel like my faith has allowed me to dig, to like kind of dig deeper in different ways um, in the sense of like, I've definitely had times where I feel like God has given me the strength to do things like, it's like, wow, I didn't know if I was capable of doing that or like of reaching that feat. And I think God wants all of, I mean, I don't think, I know God wants all of us to succeed and uh, achieve greatness in different areas or in whatever we desire. And so um, it's cool as I put my trust in him and training and in other things, I've been able to see him allow me to work and grow in different ways. I've had like different injuries in the past, Um, not to go off on a long tangent, but like I had injuries at, at Weber State where like it like, I had to get surgery or like I had torn labrums where I had to get PRP injections and like seemed like at the most inconvenient time ever. And I'd be like, oh, like it's hard not to ask like, oh God, like why now? Like why is this happening or whatever? But um, as I take a step back and like try to see like his plan for me, um, those seasons turned out like better than I could even have imagined. Like the first time I was all American, I dealt with so many like just like hiccups, I was like, oh, like there's no way. Like I had these big goals and aspirations that I'd I'd made and wanted to be accountable at achieving. And I was like, oh, like, like serious, like why now? Like why am I dealing with this now kind of thing? Um, But as I put my trust and faith in him and like in the plan and and just build up that I had done, like 
I cross trained really hard and I still like worked really hard and I was able to get back to running towards the end of the season and achieve those goals. And so it was like really cool, like to see that God does have a plan for us. And sometimes it's like different, like not all of it is mm -hmm. like this perfect ending of like, oh, like I, I did as well as I wanted or whatever. But I think oftentimes like you don't necessarily get the answers, um, at least in this life. And sometimes you just will look back on it um, I believe in like another life after this, but like look back in, in the next life and be like, oh, like that's why God was giving me those challenges or that, that journey to help shape me in this way, so. Mm -hmm. So sounds like perspective is a huge part of your like running journey and like who you feel like you are and also if you feel like you want to become. Oh, for sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. I definitely do uh, better at it at different times in my life, but yeah, I, I think it's always a good reminder of like okay like take a step back like try to look at the grand scheme of things and realize like what you're trying what is god trying to teach me at this point in my life uh what do i need to learn from this experience from this trial um and how can i learn and grow going forward from here mm. so yeah what do you where do you see yourself in the next couple of years <laughs> with trail running specifically i guess that's like kind of the focus of this podcast we do a lot of outdoor stuff yeah um where do you see yourself with trail running yeah i'd love to i got a big like schedule lined up for this summer which mm -hmm. i'm super excited about i think even more competitive races than previous year so i'm excited to get like some really good competition mm -hmm. and i'd love to get a sponsor i've been talking to a few brands and i'm hoping to wrap something up here soon um for when i end uh my collegiate season here in june so mm -hmm. I'm hoping that I can find a brand that sees my vision both on the roads and on the trails. Mm -hmm. um, I I definitely think my passion is a little more on the trails, but I'd love uh, for a brand to be able to support me on the road to allow me to do some cross country races here time to time and also mm -hmm. do the roads because I feel like I have the best of both trainings here in Utah. I can run the mountains whenever I want and do the stuff I love there. But then when I want to get some speed and turnover, which I think is very complimentary and really needed in trail running i can go join uh clayton and connor and jared and whoever uh, else is joining that group by then we have so many amazing mm -hmm. distance runners here in utah so yeah so kind of just to wrap this up to our listeners um we're kind of an endurance podcast so to any like endurance junkie or endurance athlete do you have maybe one actionable item that you would recommend that's helped you more than anything else has in your running career yeah um <sighs> that's hard to pinpoint like so a hard. specific so one yeah <laughs> but i think sleep and recovery is so key um which isn't what i'm gonna pick but i do i do want to put a little note in there for that um you can train as hard as you want, but it does absolutely nothing unless you recover. Like recovery is where you get those benefits from the training. So I think just listening to your body and tapering back when it's like, when you're just feeling overtrained and listening and realize like, hey, like don't freak out. Like you're not gonna lose fitness for taking a little bit of a down week or something like that. I think that's really important. And I think I could have done a better job at avoiding some of these injuries by doing that. Mm -hmm. And then I think the big thing though is setting goals. like. When I look back on like my running career and the things I've been able to achieve, like the times I've had goals is like, it's, dra it's drastically different, like from when I haven't had goals. And I'm probably gonna butcher the statistics on it, but like people that have like goals compared to people that don't are like 80% more likely to be successful. And then it's something like people that have written down the goals versus people that just have verbalized the goals. Those people are like three times more likely to succeed than those that haven't written down the goals. And so, the times I've been able to achieve like all American or like win great races or stuff like that. Like I've wrote down what I want to do. And then I've wrote like how I'm going to get there. Like, what am I going to do to get to that point? And I think having an actionable plan of like, okay, like I'm going to do these runs and I'm going to go for these FKTs or to simulate something, or I'm going to, put in these workouts um, and I'm gonna succeed and do well at these races to get me to this point. Like having an actionable and like a smart plan that is achievable and realistic, like that's what's really helped me. Mm -hmm. But I also think you gotta stretch yourself. Like, yeah, I know, I think it's really important. And I, I also think like having someone accountable because if you, you just have a goal and you no one knows about it, like mm -hmm. it's so easy to just be like, oh, like 
when things start to go sideways and like you get injured or like something like that, like, like I, okay, it wasn't really a goal of mine. That I'll just do it. You know, actually my goal. <laughs> yeah, you know, like I'll do it next year or something. So yeah. those times when I've had those goals, have been like a game changer, especially even when I got injured because I was like, okay, I'm still going to work my butt off to see if I'm ready. And if I am healthy by the time that gets there, then great. Like I've done the work and I can feel good about going into the race. So that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Christian. You are an amazing athlete and I've really enjoyed just like hearing insights about how you think about things and all the races you did last year. So thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Thanks, Abigail. Thanks for listening to me ramble on. And I, it's been great being on the podcast. And if anyone wants to follow you on your like running journey or the races that you're doing this year, where can they find you online? Yes. Um, I use Instagram and my handle is slim the runner. Um, <laughs> and then I also use Strava and I think if you look up Slim or Christian Allen or something like that, you'll find me. But it's also linked on to my Instagram. I think I have mm. in there. I created a website that kind of keeps all my like race results and other stuff when I'm talking to sponsors, um, which mm. is just slimtherunner.com. And I think that has links to like my Strava and other stuff like all that. Things. So, yeah. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you.